on the cusp of the last economic collapse, the Great Recession, and having studied economics as an undergraduate at Duke, um, I kind of pulled together all these different strands of my, of my life to make these, these projects. So in this book, and I'm going to show you, the Extinction Party is, um, is the combination, it's sort of an interwoven narrative of four totally distinct projects that were all made in the studio, that were all made under kind of a common set of ideas, but they're different from one another in many ways, um, both as their sort of their process, their subject matter. Um, I think a lot of, I don't, again, I won't speak for Paul, a lot of artists of my sort of, you know, Gen X generation were very um, influenced by Richard Mizrock and his use of, you know, creating a, one big superstructure for the ideas and then interconnected chapters, you know, like chapters in a novel. And so ultimately that's what, what my book became. Um, Paul mentioned that I, I've been writing for, I've had a weekly column for the last nine years and been a writer for 10 years at this really um, popular photo blog called A Photo Editor. And for most of the nine years, I've been reviewing photo books. You know, for there were multiple years where I wrote a book every week. Um, and then there were times where I inter, you know, uh, interconnected interviews or travel pieces. Of course, I'm not doing much travel writing these days. <laughs> with the total lack of travel outside my, my laps around my farm. So uh, having had a lot of experience reviewing books, you know, I, I felt a lot of pressure to, to wait to make a, a book until I had the really perfect idea. And uh, that's what we tried to accomplish with Extinction Party. So um, I, will, I will switch to the screen share um, and then use that as sort of an opportunity to uh, Let's see. To um, to sort of explain the four different projects. Do you see my screen yet? Is it working or no? No. No. Okay. Whatever, whatever web browser you're using is not up. Just go to this. To this. Whatever software you're using. I don't know if you're using Acrobat or. Uh, it's preview. Preview. Uh, right. Just just make sure preview is the main window that we're look, you're looking at. It, it is, and I'm clicking share. Let's see. Yeah, it might be, Does it, it doesn't need to be enabled. I'm doing present now, let's see, a window. Let's try, here we go. I just needed to click it slightly differently. How about now? No, nah, here it goes. You got yep. it. You got it. There it okay. is. Okay, so um, you see a picture of it? Are we good? Yes, we see it. Looks okay. good. So the the book, as I said, is a is an interconnected narrative, and uh, you know we ended up using a variety of repeating symbols and motifs because they were they were available in my work. So the the projects are based around the idea that the American economy is you know is consumption driven. I mean that was something that really stuck in my mind um, back when I first began. The, the first project, which was called The Value of a Dollar, which was looking at, at food as a sort of simple set of contemporary culture. I remember on the cusp of the Great Recession reading that like 67 to 70% of the American economy was based on consumption. You know, and I had the thought, well, what happens if everybody just stops buying stuff all at once? Like, what if we stop consuming? What happens? And of course, you know, we saw that in the Great Recession, which was sort of my economic uh, stone for a long time until I guess you know five six months ago when the in, when the entire American economy stopped functioning again because people stopped buying things so the, the larger book is sort of a, an exploration of the way our consumption and our overconsumption habits um, lead to things like climate change you know because they were constantly churning up the earth's resources to buy more and more things and then throw them away in the garbage. So the first project looked at food. The second project looked at uh, land and nature. The third project looked at my own garbage, the trash that I had accumulated in the studio I was leaving. And then the fourth, uh, the final project was sort of an extension of that in other people's trash. So that, uh, in order to, to focus on other people's garbage, I did a project called Party City is the Bubble. And you're looking at party supplies as sort of the ultimate um, superfluous consumption object, because as most people know, 
when you go to the party supply store, pretty much everything you're going to buy is, uh, is meant to be thrown in the trash. So this is the opening image of the book, which comes right after uh, silver inset page. So we have silver in our, in our inset page because the colors, uh, you know, I wanted to choose something that would be that would be neutral that would actually go with this crazy garish color palette that we created that was inspired by the Party City work. The covers are magenta and blue, magenta on foil on blue, red foil on yellow, green foil on purple, and orange foil on turquoise. So after the silver and then uh, the intro text, including an essay by Kevin Kwan, who wrote the Crazy Rich Asians trilogy, um, this is the opening picture in the book, and it's certainly one of my all-time favorites. Um, and I, I guess I changed the titles of my work occasionally. And so um, for this one, uh, we're calling it for the book. It's mostly what it was at the time. It's called, I took this from the trash and put it on my face. So I was sort of inspired here by, you know, um, death masks, which is a, an ancient tradition. And this was a piece of balled up aluminum foil that had been originally coating a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And I wasn't spending much time in my studio. This is back in 2013 because I just had my second child and I wasn't in there very long. So I had a PB&J sandwich and I chucked it in a nasty, dirty plastic garbage bin. And then six months later, I looked down when I was making art and there it was, you know, untouched. So it was garbage that had been, I guess tinfoil doesn't rot, but it was sitting there for for six months and I took it out and unfurled it and pressed it against my face. And then uh, I photographed it as sort of a, an idea of a death mask, but then the mask, something that became a repeating motif through all these projects. And of course, releasing this book in 2020, masks have never been more, um, more powerful. So from there, I'm not tracking the entire book, but the opening run that I'll show you guys does, uh, does track to the beginning. So this is called, uh, God, I don't, I, I've been long enough and I've got enough going on. I'm actually looking at the book to remember my own titles. First Communion Balloon and Turquoise Plastic Tablecloth. So you can kind of just make out the edge of a cross and the word communion. But um, this is from the Party City is the Devil project. And I bought a bunch of uh, balloons and blew them up and, and left them on the, on the studio table. They were under a, a skylight because the entire project was lit with natural light only. I built these sort of light tunnels using foam core. And so I let them sit there for two or three weeks and most of the balloons actually melted into liquid, including a different picture in the, in the book. But this one um, just had that deflated, sad, um, iconographic quality that um, really sets the tone for the book. And then, uh, this one, again, um, I retitled things for a, a big museum show I had at one point, and this one became duck mostly made of human skin, because it is. But of course, the sort of industrial space age, you know, 21st century, 21st century, you know, hyper real, crazy color palette is basically industrial chemicals on, you know, synthetic fiber, and, uh, so for this project, you know, I had, I was moving out of my studio because I couldn't afford it anymore. You know, we had a, a second child and I had to give it up so I could pay for diapers and things. And I am a bit of a pack rat as many artists are. So I accumulated, I mean, the studio was just, it was a mess. And I'm putting that, I'm putting that kindly. I mean, there were piles of crap everywhere, just junk, and garbage and junk mail everywhere. And so I decided to, again, turn the, the trash into art and you know, kind of take something that had a negative value as Paul was saying with negative space and try to turn it into something positive. You know, I use my art to kind of understand the world. And so I made it like a game where I would go into the studio and I would, you know, take trash and, you know, from the floor, pick it up, make a photograph, throw it into a clean garbage bag. And then I would take that garbage bag to the dump because at the time we didn't even have garbage deliver garbage pickup. So um, the idea was that, you know, everything would, would have its sort of essence sucked out to become art and then it would go sit in a landfill um, forever. So a picture like this represents an object that will, 
you know, God only knows how long it takes industrial, you know, uh, chemically treated synthetic fiber to, um, to biodegrade if, you know, if ever. So in the book, we call this one, um, don't worry, everything is going to be okay, question mark. And this is from 2013, if you can believe it. So this, as far as I know, this predates emojis or certainly emojis in, in regular culture. And this was again, from that same project. And so it used to be called Purple Pop Rocks and Exposed Photo Paper because I had, you know, uh, I don't know if you guys, the students are probably too young maybe to know what Pop Rocks are. They're this candy from like the 70s and 80s where you put it in your mouth and it fizzes. And when we grew up, I think Paul's probably about my age, give or take, there was this, this like urban legend about a, a little boy who had been on this famous TV commercial and that he died from having like Pop Rocks and Coca-Cola and his stomach exploded. Oh, so Pop Rocks has this, right, Mikey from the Life Cereal commercial. So, and then I just kept sheets of exposed photo paper, you know, chromogenic paper that had been exposed to light. There was no reason to keep that stuff. I mean, I just had piles of trash everywhere. So um, the, this idea of the mask and the artificial face runs through the book, um, including the, the cover. Now, uh, I mentioned the first project was about food. And it, it's called The Value of a Dollar. And the, the gist of it was that I spent, um, I guess, the, the spring of 2008, just when the American economy was, was crashing and the consumption was contracting, looking at using food as a, a sort of equivalent language. I measured out a dollar's worth of all this food from around the world, you know, and I just plopped it down on my studio table uh, with no artificial light, no retouching, it was sort of based around the idea of the way fast food creates an artificial language around food. So I wanted to create sort of a, not objective, because, you know, as an artist, we're trained not to use that word, but a very straight, unmanipulated version of what things are. So this is actually called $1 uh, worth of pig fat. And that is a ball of lard. It's literally a, a cylindrical ball of pig fat. Hmm which is in this case, I think in this edit I made for you guys, which is mostly the edit that we published in the Washington Post. This is the equivalent, or well, I guess we jumped of, uh, of uh, well, this isn't uh, from that project. This is from the project in which I commodified nature. So commodification, I think, is a, is a word. It's become more popular lately, and it's kind of dry, and maybe it's a little art school-y. Like, I, don't, I certainly don't want to be bored with big, boring, you know, economics words, but the idea, I think uh, this picture was made in 2011, so nine years ago. And I think these days, because of social media and the gig economy and the freelance world, I think people are sort of comfortable with this idea that all humans are basically treated as as commodities. You know, we have a certain value and the, the big system wants to extract that value from us and, and kind of throw us away. And maybe that's a little bit bleak, especially for a guy who lives on a beautiful horse farm. But, um, you know, the world is at the brink right now, I think, because of a lot of these ideas have been proven true. I mean, even those poor secret service agents, you know, trapped in a car with our president, you know, their lives have an economic value and, and um, you know, they don't have a say in things. So this, this project from 2011 and 12 is called Mine. And after I had done the project about food, you know, and the way food crisscrosses the globe. Um, I wanted to make a, a project about this farm and this place, but I didn't want to just make pretty nature pictures. And so I was thinking a lot about the economic concept of private property, which means if you own something, you can do whatever you want with it. You know, and it is a, it's a concept, it's an idea in capitalism that a piece of paper gives you the right to do what you want. You know, where I live, the land used to belong to the House Pueblo, to the Native Americans, and then that land was taken from them by Spanish conquistadors in the 17th century, you know, and then that land was taken from the Spanish colonists by America in the, in the mid 19th century. So this idea that, you know, if land is yours, you can do what you want with it, it leads to all sorts of things like mountaintop mining and, you know, resource extraction and uh, ultimately the things that cause greenhouse gases and warming of the planet. So I have this idea that 
if the land was mine, then I should be able to do whatever I wanted with it. So I could go out there and, and take from the land, you know, take these resources that were mine and mine the land of those resources and then bring them into the studio and turn them into sort of sculptures, temporary sculptures, photograph them, you know, extract their value. It's sort of a, a structural metaphor for capitalism. So this, not surprisingly, is called My Snowballs. And then uh, in the book, it's paired. These are, we didn't show you the PDF just because the, the pictures would look a little small. But this was sort of one of the, the canonical images from the value of a dollar. And it's called One Dollar's Worth of Sure Fine Flower. And uh, I was heavily influenced as an art student by uh, a lot of uh, Chinese and Japanese landscape painting and 19th century Japanese woodblock prints. So this was sort of, in my mind, it was kind of like homage to um, the Mount Fuji images uh, by uh, Hokusai. But when I first began to show this image, I swear to God, I mean, I don't know if this is an appropriate story to share with college students, but everybody would ask me, and so many people would say, is that a dollar's worth of cocaine? <laughs> is that blow? So like, I, you know, I didn't really know what to say. Obviously, I'm not a, a cokehead or anything, but most people would know <laughs> that cocaine, you know, a pile of coke costs a lot more than a dollar for sure, which is why the Colombians and the you know cartels killed all those people um, to control the trafficking. So anyway, in the book we do actually pair these two images. So um, it's blow and snow, which is kind of a you know a little inside joke, I guess, that most people won't get. And uh, this is one of the sort of main images from the value of a dollar, and then it's called one dollar's worth of potted meat food product. And this is actually chickens, pigs, and cows all smushed up together into one little um, cat food-like mystery meat. I mean, really, it is kind of cat. It's like cat food for humans, but they add some, you know, a lot of salt and some, uh, some spices. So the, the project really was meant to kind of look at not just the way shipping food around the world, you know, creates footprint issues and the way healthy food is so much more expensive than unhealthy food. But also there was a whole theme running through the series and now through the book about the way we, you know, we take animals and we do, uh, we do with them what we choose again, under industrial capitalism. And I actually, I photographed the slaughter of some cows in a slaughterhouse in 2009 for a commission that I, I turned into a little mini series, but I've seen with my own eyes. I mean, I was, you know, a foot away from a, a skinned cow focus right after they chopped its head off. I've seen for myself, you know, how we create our food and it's not, it's not pretty. So this is called $1 worth of shrimp flavored ramen noodles. So uh, I'm sure everyone's, you know, familiar with the concept of inflation and that typically things end up costing more money over time or you get less value you know for, for your dollar over time so uh, that's one of the reasons why the library of congress purchased the entire project was to be able to lock in this view of of food at a given time in american history so in 2008 i was able to purchase seven packets of shrimp flavored ramen noodles for a dollar at the super save the local discount store and so when you look at the pile of dust, that's literally shrimp. I mean, that's crustaceans that were swimming in the Gulf of Mexico or Lord knows where, you know, more likely something, you know, somewhere in Thailand or Vietnam and, you know, get yanked out of the Gulf of Tonkin and, you know, run through the, the processor mill before they're shipped around the world. And eventually they're quite literally turned into dust. I mean, it's not a metaphor. That's shrimp dust. And uh, it's nice that I mentioned the meat and now we've got it in this edit. This is called $1 worth of beef shank from Super Save. So um, most people aren't able to see it, but uh, if in case you can, this is quite literally a cross section of a cow's leg. So I don't, will my cursor show up? Can you guys yeah. see my cursor? Yes. So, right, this is 
a femur, and this is a tibia. So what reads as texture and color and a sort of odd kind of beauty, almost like a continent shape, is uh, the femur of a cow that has been run across a, a bandsaw. And so when I first bought the picture, it was meant to kind of illustrate this idea that you only get a little bit of meat around your bone. And so the bones are used typically to release the marrow into soups or stews. But after I shot it, I, I became um, sort of entranced by this idea that people could imagine. I mean, you guys are right. We're talking to Philly. You know, I, I don't know how many people, again, I'm, I don't know if I'm dating myself by age, but back in the day, you know, Rocky was like the greatest movie of all time. Everybody loved Rocky. And one of the seminal <laughs> moments was Sly Stallone beating the shit out of those, you know, sides of beef hanging in the, in the cooler. So, and again, I've seen with my own eyes, you know, the cow carcass turned into a side of beef, but this is a, a huge hunking animal leg, you know, that was just treated like uh, a commodity and just cut into little strips for, uh, for cheap meat at the discount store. And this is uh, $1 worth of chicken eggs from a factory farm in Texas. Uh, again, 2000, this is 2010 dollars, and that was the equivalent of one fancy duck egg that I purchased at the, the gourmet store. So within the book and then within the series, this idea of presenting you know images next to each other to create equivalents, but also within a, a book, you know one of the best ways to make a good book is to create linkages between images, and runs of images so that as you're turning the pages, you know, your mind is moving back and forth. And some of them are, are beautiful. I mean, it was kind of a nice lead up talking about my crazy iPhone Instagram series because this idea of, you know, presenting beauty and grotesquerie together, I would say is maybe one of the, the um, strongest themes that runs through my, my artwork or writing as well. And this is, uh, this is my little, I had one real homage in the book. This was an homage to, to John Baldessari, one of my favorite artists of all time. And uh, in the book, we called this one, everything is for sale with an exclamation point, which was kind of like a, an ironic tongue in cheek exclamation point. But um, this also came from the series where I, where I just threw stuff away. Because at one point, my studio had been a little gallery you know, and when you try to sell art, of course, anybody who's been to an art gallery um, before they all shut, you know, if you sell a picture, you put a red dot next to it. So I went to Walmart and not surprisingly, they don't just sell red dots. I mean, it's not common enough thing for Walmart to sell a box of red dots. So I found this primary color sort of Mondrian inspired, Baldessari inspired color circles, which I bought. And I don't think I ever sold anything from that gallery. So they just sat in a pile, you know, in the trash until I, until I made a picture out of it. This is from a most recent project, Party City is the Devil. And so this is called uh, Blue Streamers and Red Plastic Tablecloth. One of my favorites. This is my tumbleweed. So this is from the mine project. Picked up a piece of tumbleweed. I mean, nothing, I think very few things are more sort of symbolically resonant of the American Wild West than rolling tumbleweed. So at the time, I just picked the tumbleweed up off the ground, you know, took it into the studio, took a picture of it, and then, you know, chucked it back outside to, uh, to roll away into someone else's dust. Hmm. This is one of the seminal images in the, in, the pro, in the book and in my work, not surprisingly. It's called My Deer Head. And uh, there's a, I wrote a story about this in the book um, because I wrote a couple of stories that were interspersed. There was a moment in time back in 2011 where uh, there, were, there were more dogs on the farm than we have now. And uh, the deer, you know, either the dogs brought it down or the deer um, died of natural causes, perhaps, and I found it the next day 
in a in the freezing stream. Everything was ice cold. It was you know uh, late March, early April, and so I had this idea to chop off the deer's head and turn it into a photograph like this. And so I, you know, as a as I said, I've lived on the farm for a while, but at heart I'm like a little suburban Jersey boy from the shore. So it was pretty edgy, uh, edgy thing to do. And I got all dressed up in my ranch gear and I grabbed a hatchet and I tried to chop the head off and I couldn't even like make a nick. I and mean, was, it was impossible. I didn't even come anywhere close to getting through the skin. So I gave up and then I, I had the idea to chop off the deer's paw uh, or the, the lower leg and I was able to do that. But I walked away from the head and, and I walked away and left the deer lying there. And then the, the farm dogs actually chewed the deer's head off on their own, intact. And my mother-in-law fought the dogs for the deer head so that I could photograph it. It's the sort of closing story in the book because I the phone rang one day and uh, it was my mother-in-law who's a tough, tough lady, obviously. The story probably proves it. And she was screaming, you know, I got the head, I got the head. And I was like, what are you talking about? Foothead, what do you mean? I got the deer head. I was like, how did you get the deer head? And she said, well, the dogs chewed it off and I, I fought them for it. And it's in the freezer in a black plastic bag. You know, you can come get it. And I said, I, I don't need it. I already photographed the paw. I'm good. You know, thanks anyway. And she said, no, you're not. Like that, that deer head is not staying in my freezer. Like you can come get it. That's that. I was like, all right, I'll. You got it. You're the boss. I'll come get it, and I'll uh, I'll make a picture. So uh, I was thinking very much of like, you know, a Pieta, the the classic art historical image of Jesus with his head kind of lolling off to the side on um, on Mary's lap. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, kind of became the seminal image for the Party City project. Because I made this, I guess, a few days after Trump was inaugurated in um, in 2016, in January. So this is called Blue Mask, Red Gumballs, and Yellow Plastic Tablecloth. And uh, it was sort of the first time that I really channeled that really dark, angry, uncomfortable energy, you know, masquerading in shiny, happy colors. So, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I have to think about it. I think I've shown you at least two masks already, um, and then there are more to come. But uh, looking back now from the vantage of, you know, most of the way through 2020, I'm pretty proud of this one because I think it it kind of captured what has become the Trump era, that idea of veneer and gloss and bluster. And, of course, there's nothing under the masks. They're hollow. So it's like... Uh, you know, taking something shiny and glitzy and turning it into something macabre. Yeah. And, and this is called My Turf. So this is from the Mine Project. And as you can imagine, I literally went up to a, a chunk of grass with a shovel and I just, you know, took the earth from itself, basically. I mean, it felt like stealing, you know, taking. I mean, that's what we do. And I, I mean, I'm complicit, you know. I try to consider my consumption but I'm not like some monk living off a grid. You know, we all do it. But the point of the work over this 10 year period was to try to draw attention. You know, as artists, there's only so much we can do, but if we have a platform and we have viewers, then we can communicate ideas. So this picture has become very, you know, um, popular and meaningful simply because it, it kind of explains itself, you know? You can see the roots and you can see that it doesn't belong where it is. You know, it's like taking nature from itself and putting it on display. And then this is called $1 worth of tomatillos from Mexico. This one also doesn't require a lot of explanation. Um, but this idea of, you know, cutting something apart and putting it back together feels very apropos, you know, right now in our, our current moment here in America, you know. We've obviously been, you know, divided and whether we can put ourselves back together or not remains to be seen. But it's also plays with that tension, something beautiful, but also, you know, wrong. It's a nice transition, <laughs> if, I, if I'm allowed to say that. 
But this is, uh, you know, I harvested these icicles by hand with a ski pole. I literally knocked the icicles off the roof and caught them in midair one at a time um, and then packed them up with some snow in an igloo cooler and took them to the studio. So this was my idea of making a jail out of icicles, you know, a prison out of nature. And then this is, uh, we saw earlier, I showed you the, the blue streamers against the red plastic tablecloth. So this is red, red streamers and blue plastic tablecloth. And for those of, those of you out there who are technicians, this is again, all natural light. It was like a, a brown carpeted studio with brown walls, but I built this little light tunnel to sort of amplify just the teeniest little bit of a skylight with these huge 40 by 60 inch reflectors. So it, it created this amplification effect so that the color would really pop. And, you know, and the color theory is a big part of the book and the work. You know, uh, most people don't pick up on it and some people do, but this idea of red and blue you know, I was working with the colors, sort of with the political motif in the in the background of my mind. This is called No One's Hands Are Clean. A dirty white cotton glove. You know, gloves and masks really pervade my work. And all of it, of course, was done pre-pandemic. I mean, even the title of the book, Extinction Party, was we titled it in March of 2019. So all of this, you know, having the book come out just as the pandemic dropped was um, was kind of uh, a little bit crazy. One dollar's worth of candy necklaces from China. Yellow plastic fedora and yellow plastic tablecloth. So this is another of my favorite images in that it allows a viewer to think about the you know liquefaction of plastic. I mean, basically, plastic comes from oil. Oil comes from fossilized dinosaurs. So dinosaur fossils, you know, are processed through all sorts of industrial machinery. Then it's you know mixed together in some you know Joker soup, some boiling soup of toxic industrial chemicals, you know, and then popped into an injection mold where it's I don't know. A sixteenth of an inch thick or something. I mean, it's like a shell. It's just this veneer, shiny veneer shell. So um, given that these were made so early in the Trump era, I guess they ended up kind of hitting the nail on the head a little bit. And this is called My Dead Baby Mouse. So I didn't kill the deer, but I did kill the, the mouse. There was a family of mice living in the trunk of my car. You know, <clears throat> they had a nest back there. And they were pooping and peeing all over the car. And then they started chewing up the seatbelts. And I had just had a, you know, this was before my second child, but, you know, we needed uh, needed those seatbelts in the back seat to keep the kids safe. So when I found the nest, I threw the, the babies into the field, assuming that, you know, one of the hawks or the, would eat them, you know, one of the raptors would, would just eat it in the natural process, but they didn't. So I fished the fished the baby out of the field the next day and brought it to the studio. And very often people tell me they think this photo is actually cute and sweet, which is um, kind of hard for me to believe, but I've heard it enough times that I guess it's true. But I kind of wanted to honor the animal. I felt like if I, having done what I did to kill it, then maybe I could sort of honor its spirit and sort of like, uh, I don't know, a posthumous act of respect. And here's the mask again. This is Super Mario and a green plastic tablecloth. So all of the backdrops in the Party City series are actually $1.99 plastic tablecloths from Party City. So that everything you see is, you know, again, is former natural resources that have been processed into non-biodegradable crap that most people just chuck in the trash the day they're done with it. And then we'll end here with uh, yellow mask and yellow plastic tablecloth. And my good friend and the book's designer, Caleb Kane Marcus, actually took that image and uh, 
and uh, turned it into the, so that image was sort of turned into a graphic or an icon to become the cover of the book. And uh, yeah, the beginning of what I just showed you tracks, uh, you know, tracks the, the book edit and then um, the rest I just kind of put together to show you guys a little sampling of what I do. So those four different projects were made at different times over a decade and they were all kind of designed under these ideas of how humans consume. So for the book, we brought them together to kind of tell one story instead of four separate stories. And uh, yeah, there was a really nice outpouring of uh, appreciation on social media. People would use Instagram, Instagram stories, Facebook, Twitter, you know, and hold up the book. Like I didn't ask anyone to do it, but they would like hold up the, the book in front of their face or next to their face and photograph it and then, you know, post about it. So I, I kind of felt like, you know, uh, the books had been, many of them pre-sold on Kickstarter. So when they turned up in people's mailboxes in March, this year, while everybody was in like mega, mega lockdown and wiping down all their boxes and leaving things outside to, you know, to decontaminate, it kind of, I think it spoke to people at, at just the right moment, even though, you know, the rest of our book signings were canceled and I haven't been able to go anywhere, of course, to promote it, but it, uh, it spoke to the audience directly, which as an artist, I think is, it's hard to ask for more than that. So that's, uh, that's what I've got more or less right now, if that works as far as you know opening things up to questions or comments so yes does anybody have any questions for jonathan about any of his work his art artwork or his writing or anything in general yeah i've, I've had a long career and done a lot of things and i'm so i'm happy to if anybody's looking for any thoughts or advice or you know i'll, I'll answer any questions you might have about how to have a, a long career or you know how to make work um, I won't be offended if you don't have questions, but I always love to chat with people directly. Well, I have a couple of questions if no one's going to jump in. Does sure. anyone jump in? Um, so basically, you did this in four parts. So when you initially started this, did you have the inception or conception of it being a book? And did you see the four parts actually being linked together when you first started doing it? It's a great question. Not, not at all. You know, the first project, The Value of a Dollar, um, was published by the New York Times on their on the Lens blog, which was their photo site, um, in 2010. And it went viral. So the project kind of went crazy around the world and was seen by millions of people. You know, and was on my website and on the New York Times website. Like, all the pictures were there for free. And people interacted with them through the computer. So I didn't really, at the time, feel like trying to commodify it and turn it into a book and ask people to buy it, it didn't make any sense to me. You know, we met at a portfolio review, you know, a festival, which hopefully those things will exist again. And I was at a, I was at a festival that year, 2010, and I chatted with a, a very, very well-respected photo book publisher named Dawi Lewis from Manchester, England, who's become a, a friend and a colleague since. And he actually told me you know, he was encouraging me not to ever make a book until I had a really, really solid idea. You know, he said these days, and that was 10 years ago, every artist wants a book for every project. Everybody thinks every single thing should be a book always. And he'd been doing it for 30 years at that point. And he said, I don't, you know, that's bollocks or something like that. You know, some English expression. He's like, you know, make a book. You don't get to redo a book. You know, if you don't, if you jump the gun, you don't get to redo it. So just wait, you know, make a book when you're ready, make a book when you want to make a book, when you feel like you have a really strong need to do it. And so when I made the first project, I had no idea that anything would come after it in sequence. So I, I couldn't have possibly imagined that I would continue working that way, but I did have this very strong idea implanted in me not to do a book, just to do a book, you know? And ultimately I waited 10 years to make a book, which I guess it seems like a long time, you know, we're almost 10 years because we started in 2019. But, you know, as a book reviewer, I knew that people, you know, I could be critical in my writing. I knew that people, if I made a crap book, the knives were going to come out hard, you know, and people <laughs> would cut it to pieces. This asshole who's always criticizing us made a, a crappy book, like, you know, so uh, I waited is the answer. I waited until I felt like I I had a really strong vision. And once there were four projects, once they did interconnect, once there was this through line, then I was able to see it. 
Like, you know, why, you know, people are like, you going to make a book about the party city work. And I thought, no, but I think now is time to, to make a book about all of the work together. And the, my publisher had approached me early on and I knew she was interested. So yeah, we, we got the idea and we did it. But that's a great question. Thanks. Anybody else have any questions? Someone you. Yeah, Jennifer just popped one up. Let's see. Has the fact that you're seeing the same surroundings, not traveling repeatedly over the past many months affected what inspires you about the environment? Do you notice things in a new way? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, there's this, uh, I'm going to just try to screen share again um, because I actually set it up so that I could, a Chrome tab, so that I could do this. Um, in the beginning, like, I, as I said, I started in, so the first pictures were just these beautiful nature shots. Um, I don't know, what, well, I might not be able to do this. If you guys are seeing my screen, for some reason, Instagram is, um, is shutting me out right there. So the answer is that, yes. You know, the beginning, it was just about looking in these open vistas and looking at the beauty um, and trying to share it with people. But this that didn't feel authentic to me because as you just saw in my artwork, I'm not terribly interested in beauty for its own sake. So this ridiculous amount of repetition, you you notice the I noticed the changing of the light, you know, the changing of the color palette. Uh, if new things pop up, I notice them right away, like on Saturday. So today's what? Today's Tuesday. On Saturday, the day that we woke up to the news that the president of the United States had coronavirus, one of the neighbors had put up, you know, somebody who's like attracting Airbnb people from Texas who break the quarantine. They put up a little mini American flag. And as soon as I walked by it, I watched the wind catch it. And like, so boom, you know, there's a new picture. So I think it, um, and part of you know, we've had some personal difficulty, like a lot of people have, you know, um, at the very beginning of the, the quarantine, we diagnosed my wife as having had, you know, moderate to severe clinical depression over many years that we weren't able to catch, you know, in the kind of crazy life pace pre-quarantine. So, you know, dealing with her illness and getting her healthy meant that the first months of things were really stressful. And as my life got better and calmer, I think I was able to start to you know, to focus more on sort of Zen concepts of appreciating living in the moment. And so, yeah, the work, the photographs, anybody that, you know, it's available for the public to see, Jay Blau photo. So the progression is pretty obvious from, you know, pure natural beauty and one style of shooting to this sort of weaving together of daytime, nighttime, morning light, afternoon light, and going from just big vistas to a lot of really, really very tightly focused, tightly seen images. Um, some of which are edgy and some of which are not. But yeah, it's very much like, um, you know, it's probably a common reference, but Groundhog Day, you know, that great um, Harold Ramis, Bill Murray movie, which I know has now been redone in a variety of other concepts. But yeah, I, I never would have thought that I could walk in circles for <laughs> for six months and not get bored, you know. Um, it's uh, visual therapy. Yeah, it is. And walking is, you know, it's just trying to do what we what we can do. The the walking is good. The I mean, we're famous for our light out here. We do have kind of extraordinary natural light. So I think I've become more enamored of the subtleties of light, color of light, you know, and I, there are portraits now. I began photographing people and my shadow is a repeating motif. So it's kind of become a more traditional art project for me. But, you know, we always talk about get out of that comfort zone. I was very comfortable working in a studio with a big camera and a razor sharp lens and controlling everything. So moving, you know, if you would have told me I was going to work with my cell phone and walk in circles for six months, I would have said, you know, no effing way, not possible. But you know, when you're an artist this long, you, um, you have to adapt. But Jennifer, that was a great question. And she, thank you. You, yeah, she posted the handle J Blau photo. There's a, there's a lot there to see. Um, and, uh, yeah, Anybody else or Paul, any, any other, I mean, I, I don't want to insist on questions, but I, I've got a lot of, a lot of background in the field. If I can help any of these students with specific questions, I'd be happy to. 
Well, for my students, it's one o'clock, so this is the break. If they want to stick around, they can stick around. No, and if we're if we're good, like I said, I'm here to help. Uh, you know, we have plenty of questions. There's people online. If they want to stick around, we could ask questions. We could all chat. But sure. for them, you know, I don't want to keep them. This is no, please. They have a class in an hour, so it's important that they get their break. So well, I'm happy to. Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, happy so, to stick around for a couple of minutes if if people do, and if they don't, I've got thick skin. I won't be offended. I was. I was a student for many years, and I know what it's like to get hungry at lunchtime. So, <laughs> I've heard some dude blabber on from the other side of the country with uh, his little track jacket. So, uh, I have so lots of questions for you because you know I've seen your work, and it's what I love about it is, and just as they're leaving, I just say it, one of the reasons I chose you to talk is because okay. your work covers two of the themes that we've been working for over this project. Uh, these two past projects. One was Society and Critique, and now this new one they're working on is called Places and Objects. So it was like, when I, you know, you had a book piece, so I was like, oh yes, you'd be perfect to come and speak to them, basically. Um, the Critique on Society is amazing, and it's, there's a lot of depth to it, which I really enjoy. Um, multiple levels, because once you just look at the image, the images are very simple. They get you to think, and then when you see in the context of what you're trying to do, opens up many more doors. And then just the plain, you know, object, which is a device also to use as something to get people to look at your images and start them thinking about what society and critique were given to society. So yes, I mean, I think it works really strong and it's- Thanks, man. I think yeah. that, you, know, you took your time to do it and you developed it over the years instead of it just, as you said, just oh, rush to get a book. Because, uh, you know, I, I sat with Dewey Lewis, too, and it was just, he just says, no, nah, this book isn't for me. It's, <laughs> it's an American book. And I was like, okay, that's cool. I respect you. But, right. you know, I see what he does, and he we sat and talked also. But, yeah, um, the advice he gave you is, like, make a book when you're ready to make a book. It's so important because there is the rush for people to go out and constantly just say, I have to make a book. Why? Is it right. new or is it, you know, does it mean to be in a book? I think a book is a very different thing than work that hangs on the wall. Yeah, well, it was what he said at the time. You know, it was back in the day, if an artist had one or two books in their career, or three books in their, you know, that was a career maker. Yeah. You know, like, I remember, you know, being an art student in, at UNM in 1999. If somebody had a book, it was a really big deal. So over time, you know, because of supply and demand and the changing models of the industry where now the artists – traditionally put up the money instead of the publisher. Like it's easy to see why so many people make so many books. But for me, um, you know, waiting was right. And now I'll be honest, like I can't wait to turn the, you know, the quarantine paradise series into a book. I'm ready to, I'm playing with it in my head because each post is like a little mini series. And then the grid itself, I kind of curate the grid. So the grid has a balance to it. You know, so I'm using the, inter the Instagram interface heavily to make it, but ultimately I'm starting to imagine the way I can weave together these repeating symbols and you know write little mini pieces. So yeah, having some people told me, you know, once you make the first one, you definitely do want to make the second. And I was like, oh, I don't know, this will probably be the only book I ever make. And now uh, I guess I got bit. Uh, <laughs> I'm ready. I'm ready for number two, and I haven't even gotten to winter yet. We're only seven months into what will likely be a Possibly a full year of quarantine. And who's to say? Yeah, so, I know. The changing seasons, the changing light. Um, so I'll get snow in there. You know, the the stream freezes over, things like that. But um, anyway, thanks for the compliments. I can I can definitely see how it does intersect with uh, with what you've been teaching about. Um, and so another thing that I thought was interesting is your reference to art history. I mean, this is the art history class, and I'm constantly showing them, you know, other work. And I do it over progression from, you know, beginning of photography up until now. So they can see the progression, how artists use the same themes, but how they adapt it to current times. And the fact that you're not only just using, you know, photographers, but you're dipping into other artists' work, as reference, I think is really important. And I think that's really good. Well, thanks. Yeah, we all, you know, in order to get to be professors and to get to have long careers, very often we go to grad school and you know, you're forced to take classes outside of your your medium, you know? I mean, it, I, 
history, like I was, a, I have a degree in history at the undergraduate level, and it was more happenstance. Like I wasn't really a history geek, but I definitely became an art history geek. It's like you take the classes, and you know, I was lucky. I mean, your your students in regular times would have access to all the museums in Philly and DC and New York. And having been an art student in New York, you know, when you can see the work for yourself, you can stand in front of Van Gogh or, or Rembrandt or Cindy Sherman or what have you, you know, you get to have a relationship with the art. So, it, yeah. it, you know, um, I think it's very easy to get to fall in love with art throughout history, especially when it's not just a couple of slides projected on the screen with a professor kind of dropping on. Like the, the work itself is meant to speak to us, you know, that, and our work is meant to speak to other people. You know, it can be um, idealistic, but it's also true, you know? And I've been fortunate as a writer, you know, and an artist to get to travel to many of the world's best museums. And so when you're, when you have that, it becomes a body of knowledge that builds up in your head, you know? Like yeah. when I was a kid, you know, the, you know, watching Michael Jordan play ball, you know, influences what I think of LeBron James, it's the same kind of thing. We'll go Philly, right? Randall Cunningham influences what I think about, uh, what's his name, Carson Wentz or something, you know? So, yeah, I, I don't think photographers, I think it's unhealthy to only be influenced by photography because it's only one little mini subset of this incredibly broad way that people have been making art over thousands and thousands of years, you know? Buildings, sculptures, and all of it. It's just another tool to express yourself um, as painting is or sculpture or printmaking and understanding, you know, what each one does and how you can more or less take from them and incorporate it into what you're trying to say is important and not realizing, oh, that's only a painting. I can't get anything from a painting. So, but that's yeah. what, like wow. that like Prince was, I was like, oh yeah, that's when you were talking about it, that's the first name that popped in my head when I saw it. Say so, again? Who? The Hokusai. Reference. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, thanks. So when I saw that, I mean, when I saw the image and you started talking about it, that's immediately what I started thinking about Mount Fuji and whatnot. So it's it's yeah. there. So you make those references, and that's good, which leads to other things. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, it, it, I like it's, it's one tool among many. Yeah, you know, art is really just a reflection of of culture. That's that's all it is. I mean, you know this, and I know this, and Eric knows this, and and probably some of your students know this. But you know. Um, I've been very, very fortunate to get to spend a lot of time over the years in great museums. And you walk from one, you know, era into the next era. And if you're looking at, you know, a wall carving from Mesopotamia of, you know, somebody wearing a, an eagle mask or something, you know, and then you go and you look at a Chinese Buddha, I mean, it's like throughout history, or you climb a pyramid in Mexico and you stand at the top you know, when you look at the sun on your face, like you understand that using, you know, making objects and images is a way of understanding the world we're living in and then leaving that artifact for the next generation. It's a continuum that's existed for as long as people have been organized, you know, in societies before that, you know, cave paintings, like it's just a human instinct to make things, you know? And so I don't know, I, you know, I'm not always serious. I swear, people who read my column know I can be about as absurd and ridiculous as anybody. But but I take some of this very seriously. I think again, it's that that Gen X severity, maybe. But like, it's a tradition that we're a part of, and I've been very lucky, and I know you've been lucky to be able to show the work and and have people see it. Once you have an audience, it also changes things. Yep. If you're making work just for yourself, that's one thing. But if you're making your art knowing that other people are going to see it, then that's a relationship you know, between you and and these random strangers, and that's quite literally a different experience than only doing it for you, you know. Which is partly why you know my wife was saying with this Instagram series. I mean, I, I swear I, I didn't even really use Instagram very much before I made a project on it. Like I'm the last guy who would have done this, but she said, you know, it's just true. I mean, anybody could look at my feed. You know, before I started shooting three or four times a day. I would go two weeks without putting anything up or, or longer. Like it just wasn't my methodology. But she said the other day, you know, with galleries, people can't go to galleries and books take so much work to make. You're using this interface where you're constantly engaging with people every day. 
and you know, it's just a new school way of, of showing work. But you know, when you have a certain amount of followers, you know that a certain amount of people are going to see it, and that creates that relationship, which um, which to me is pretty interesting. You know, instead of just doing it for myself, I like the engagement. It is good. Yeah. So I have one final question. I don't know if anyone else has any questions, but I'm going to ask this one. So Please. as the educator talking to students, right? Um, your background is in history and then art history. Why did you choose photography as your medium? Well, my as an artist, I mean, photography really was was the beginning of all of it. You know, like I I studied economics and history at Duke. I was a double major, and I wasn't an artist, but I was a miserable guy. Like it wasn't for me. So I took some time off and I moved out here because my folks had been here, and I kind of figured out that something creative was coming my way. So when I got out of college, I worked on a few movies in New York, um, and when I was moving back to New Mexico. I just, you know, on a solo five-day cross-country drive, I just grabbed some film for an old point-and-shoot camera that I had. I mean, it was a total improvisational instinct thing. Like, I think, I, you know, there was no reason to do it. I just had this weird random idea to buy some film. And so I did. And I took my first picture before I even left the apartment I was staying in. Like, I, I just got immediately hooked. You know, I, was, I guess the answer is I was looking for something. Young, I was 23, 22, I guess, and I was looking for something. And then as soon as I got that camera in my hand, it's kind of like what what's happening now, all these years, years, all these years later. I think for a lot of photographers, when you have the camera in your hand and you're looking at the world, you just look more deeply, you look more clearly. You know, the camera is sort of like a device that kicks on sort of a Zen way of seeing, and it it did that for me. So the, as soon as I got a camera in my hand at that phase of my life, like that was it. You know, and I have done other things. I do installations sometimes, drawing and writing. I love writing at this point probably as much as photography. But the answer is that a camera, having a camera at the right time in my life changed the entire course of my life forever. And it was the ability to observe the world with more clarity, you know, to be aware is the best way to describe it. The camera made me aware, and I really liked that feeling of being aware, uh, you know, of seeing what was going on. And so I think the camera, I think I probably became addicted to the feeling more than the camera. And I hadn't really been, I was really good in school, but I never worked at anything. So once I got into photography and it created a work ethic, and I took that as a sign that I was actually willing to put some effort into something, that it probably was meaningful. So, uh, you know, shooting in a studio and playing with symbols is very different than walking around with a camera, which I'm doing again. And it's like coming full circle with my own process. But now it's, uh, you know, an iPhone, which is better than any of the, I started shooting digitally in 2002. It's like my cell phone, probably a hundred times better of a camera than, you know, the things I was using when I got to grad school uh, in 2002. So I think that's the answer. The the camera, the photographic process kind of changed who I am. And so even though I make art other ways and I'm interested in other things like art history and sports, I mean, I write a, a monthly column about my favorite English soccer team. Like I have a lot of interests. I'm a hardcore cook. But for some reason, I think that's maybe true with a lot of photographers. I mean, do you, I could turn the tables. Do you still get passionate about it? I know you've been doing it a long time. Is it still? Oh, yeah. It's still when I look through the lens, look through the, the either the ground glass or through the eyepiece, it just totally transforms the world. Um, walking around, seeing things I want to photograph is one thing, but then when I get an idea and I start working, I just get totally sucked into the. It's partly the process just sucks me in, but then as a way just to express my ideas, it's the vehicle that I choose. I mean, I could try to do it in other ways, but. For me, I say it best with the camera. That's the way I choose it. It just comes across better for me. I have more control of what I'm seeing and what I'm trying to say that way. I can go and do, you know, installation. I could do some other type of art, but it's not the same way. It's to me, it is contemporary. And that's the way I like to think about it. It's, it's a contemporary vehicle as the way painting was in one, at one time period. Photography is now. Yeah. And uh, well, anyway, thanks. Yeah. I, I, like I said, the, the prison photos that you sent me, 
it's a great way of of using a photographic imagery to communicate emotion you know it's like i think the best art speaks to the head and the heart yeah Personally, i think art that makes you think and feel is much more interesting to me than art, art that only makes me think and feel and i that was partly why the pictures that you sent me stuck in my head because they really had that <laughs> in the gut you know and uh, I appreciate that some folks have stuck around. Does anybody have any questions they want to hit me with in the in the chat, or uh, or, or have we covered the things that that people want to know? What's the story? Anybody else? You can you can ask whatever you want. I'll tell you. <laughs> what do you think, Paul? Are you good? I think we're good. good. All right. Cool. Eric, we, we covered that. Yeah, Jonathan, thank you so much. So generous and, and thoughtful. And uh, I think our students really uh, gained something excellent from your talk. I'm going to ask the library um, to, to purchase a copy of your book so the students can look at that. Oh, wow. uh, yeah, um, um, thank you. Thank you. Don't be silly. It's my pleasure. And Paul, anything, you know, I love talking to students, and Paul's a super cool dude, I hope. <laughs> you know it. I bet they do. I hope so. <laughs> you, know, um, you know me. I try to be as accessible as possible. So if anybody, you know, if anything comes up in class, you can always give out my email address. And if anyone, if there's any follow-up questions or anywhere I can help the students after the fact, please don't hesitate to ask. You know, I get a lot of, out of um, a lot of joy out of being helpful. You know, there are a lot Thank of you, in the way. All right. So Thank otherwise, you, I appreciate Thank the opportunity. It was a great group. All right, man. And hey, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate it. You're there, Jennifer. Thank you too. All right. Okay. Ciao, everybody. Ciao. All right. You got it.